we're in for a real treat. As Alex, I said this earlier, I'm gonna say it again. Uh, Rex uh, told us if we would get up and meet with Jesus every morning, he'd be our best friend. Uh, you know, Ronnie and I don't spend that much time together, but I feel like I'm getting to know him better and better because he introduces me to, to God's Word every morning. I've been in his devotional now for 27 months, and I'm recommending this highly. There are books back there if you want it for Acts, but his, his, his gospel, his, his, his review, his devotional through the Gospel of John is a two-year stint of some days the same verse as it was for three days, and it's rich. He just has a gift of opening God's Word. Um, he once, I heard him say at, at second one time that God's word is of an infinite mind, so it infinitely opens up, and the more we study and the more we understand the rest of it, the more stuff opens up. And I think that's what we're going to see today. I appreciate his devotionals and his teaching because of the way he introduced us to Jesus. So that's, that's why he's here. Um, he also is a highly, I, want, I didn't say this earlier, he's a highly underrated comedian. Um, when I asked him, you know, he's, he's really humble, but he, when I asked him about how to get books as we were introduced and telling everybody to, to get these books over Christmas, he said, back if I only had a thousand friends like you. And, and, uh, and, I, and I took it first of all, he really wants to be my friend. And then I went back and looked at the math of that, and, uh, but was still encouraged. Um, so let, let me pray, and Ronnie's going to come lead us. Lord, thank you for your work and Ronnie Collier Stevens' life. And the way he loves your word and the way he loves you and the way he uh, digs in and um, um, opens it up, the way he writes, uh, that we might know you better. So we pray for this time your spirit would be with us and that we would know you better and that would guide our lives in everything we do. We pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen. And we're going to talk about Acts 16. And we're going to talk about uh, our calling, our profession. We're going to start in the first missionary journey in Acts 13 and hit some highlights there. The uh, second missionary journey begins at the end of Acts 15. And um, I think one thing pertinent to your uh, the theme of this um, Wednesday noon meeting and early Wednesday morning meeting is um, how do we regard our profession? You know, we can, we can call it a job or we can be a little bit more elegant. We can call it a, a profession. When we, um, when we call it a vocation, we're actually sanctifying it. We're investing it with something a little bit sacred because the word vocation means calling. It's from the Latin word voco, I call vocari, to call. So, um, if, if we term it that way, somebody's got to call us. The question is, who is calling us? And we're reading something written by a man in his third profession. He was a physician who became a missionary, who became a writer, who became a historian. And Think of all the reasons that, I actually made this point, I think almost last this morning, I'll make it first today. Think of all the reasons why Luke should not have written the Gospel of Luke and Acts. I think most of you know that Acts is the second of a two volume work called Luke Acts. And um, there are lots of reason not, reasons not to write. Number one, what he did in, in the Gospel of Luke had already been done. It had already been done twice. It had already been done perfectly twice. It had already been done perfectly twice by two people who actually knew Jesus personally, which Luke did not. So think of all the reasons not to do it. And yet if he hadn't done it, you and I would not know the meaning of the term prodigal son. We would not know the meaning of the term Good Samaritan. We would know nothing of the manger, nothing of the swaddling clothes, nothing of the shepherds, nothing of the angels over Bethlehem. We would know nothing of the four great hymns of Christmas. Do you know there are four hymns of Christmas? And the ancients gave them Latin names. It was the Benedictus of Zechariah, the uh, Magnificat of Mary, the Glory Nick Chelsea's Deo, the Angels, and the Nuc Dimittis, which means now depart, now let me depart, of Simeon. Remember Simeon and Anna when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple. Now I've seen 
the one you promised me I could see, so let, let your servant depart. Um, that's called the hymn of Simeon. We would know nothing about the childhood of Jesus. There was a German scholar in the late 19th century who said that the childhood of Jesus is like a walled garden with perfumed scents, S-C-E-N-T-S, wafting over the top of the wall. But we can't see beyond the wall. But once we were thrown a bouquet over the wall, and the one who threw it was Luke, because he's the only one who tells us anything about the childhood of Jesus. We wouldn't know who Zacchaeus was. We wouldn't know anything about the Ascension. It was Luke who told us all those things that Matthew and Mark and John did not tell us. But his motive was not to tell us new things. I don't think he had the slightest idea that he was adding to the canon when he wrote Luke and Acts. He was trying to um, encourage one person in the faith, one person named Theophilus. And because he was trying to encourage one person in the faith, we have Luke X. And if you ask most Christians who wrote most of the New Testament, most Christians will tell you Paul. That would be wrong. Paul wrote most of the books of the New Testament. Luke wrote most of the words of the New Testament. Because if you add up all the words in Luke Acts, they come to more words than all the words in the 13 epistles that Paul wrote. Now, unless you were to count Hebrews. Most modern scholars don't think Paul wrote Hebrews. I'm not a scholar. I don't think Paul wrote Hebrews. Many of the older scholars did include Hebrews in the, in the Pauline canon. But think of this enormous contribution from a man who didn't start out in ministry. He came to ministry missions as his first incarnation of ministry, and then writing as a later incarnation of ministry, all because he wanted to disciple one man. I was um, privileged to go to something in 1983 in Colorado Springs at Glen Eyre called, um, called Disciple Making in the 80s. Chuck Swindoll spoke, uh, Howard Henrich spoke, um, Ray Steadman, who started Peninsula Bible Church in Palo Alto, spoke. Leroy Imes, who was deputy director of the uh, Navigators, their best speaker among their leadership, he spoke. I, I got some time with Leroy Imes, and I asked him, I was the pastor of a church of about 400 and I, on the North Carolina coast, and, I, and I, I told him a little bit about what I did, and I said, how many people should I disciple? He said, one person. I was shocked by that. One, just one person. And um, that's what Luke was doing. Luke found one person who knew more than he did, and he served him. That person's name was Paul. Luke found one person who knew less than he did, and he served him and taught him that person was named Theophilus. So if you can find one person who knows less than you, now for some of us that may be a hard job, but if you find one person who knows less than we do and begin to teach them, that's the beginning of discipleship, of discipling. And I think it's a possible goal, however busy you are or whatever else you're doing or however unqualified you feel, I think it's a possible goal for every person in this room now what happens in Acts 13 is that Paul and Barnabas are commissioned by the church at Antioch to go out as missionaries. And they take one young man with them, his name is John Mark. Now depending on what your administrative gift is, I don't have any administrative gifts. So I can live without a, if you don't believe me, ask the people who worked for with me. I, the only rule in our Munich church is was if you gave the only copy of it to Ronnie, it was your fault. And so I'm fine without a plan. Uh, I can go, you know. My motto is ready, fire, aim. And um, 
But if anybody has any administrative gifting, they'd like to have a plan. And they'd, they'd like to adhere to the plan. Now, the plan was for Paul and Barnabas to go out with John Mark. But in verse 13, John Mark bailed. And he went home. He quit. So they had hoped to staff this thing with three people, and they were cut down to a third of that. Well, in chapter 14, and it, uh, the first missionary journey in its entirety was in Asia Minor, the Roman province of Asia, what today we call Turkey. And they come in chapter 14 to a place called Lystra. And at Lystra, I told the story this morning, I'm not going to tell it again, but um, Paul was stoned. Uh, the ministry started out well, but it turned. It turned very quickly for specific reasons, and they tried to kill him. They thought they did kill him. Maybe they did kill him. Because the ancients knew when a man was dead. And you don't stone a person to hurt him. You stone a person to kill him. And they were satisfied that he was dead, and they stopped stoning him. And um, after this... Uh, turn of events, um, it says that the disciples uh, surrounded, uh, surrounded him. It says, this is Acts 14, 20. The disciples stood around him. He got up. Now, there are a couple of things there. Um, there. There are two resurrections recorded in the book of Acts. One is in chapter 9, when Dorcas, also called Tabitha, is raised from the dead by Peter. One is in Acts 20, when the young man falls out of the third balcony, dead, while Paul is preaching past midnight, and Paul raises him from the dead. It's possible that this was a resurrection also. It's not clear. I'm not saying it was, but it could have been. And um, one thing is for sure, though, his recovery was miraculous because there's no convalescence. They thought he was dead. He immediately got up and began to minister again. again. Now, here's another significant thing. He went back to Lystra. Uh, that's remarkable. They tried to kill him. He went back into the city. I don't think I would have done that. I don't think I would have advised Paul to do that. But it's a good thing he wasn't taking my counsel because he went back into the city. Now. The second missionary journey ends when they get back to uh, Antioch. Um, in, it says they sailed to Antioch in verse 26. Then there's something called the Council of Jerusalem. The Council of Jerusalem is probably the hardest ch chapter. Acts 15 is probably the hardest chapter to interpret in terms of application. Not, not about the doctrine, but about the application. So what are we supposed to do today as a result of Acts 15? I'm not going to spend any time on that. Um, there are a couple of things that are emerging here. I, I know that one, one of your great emphases is uh, our work. What are we supposed to do? And uh, connected to that is, is, is our calling. Um, so there's more than one kind of calling. There's a vocational calling. What, do, what does God want us to do? Now, I've never had the slightest doubt about, about my vocational calling. Uh, but there's also a locational calling. I've always been in doubt with a couple of very rare exceptions. Um, I knew I was supposed to go to Moscow. I knew I was supposed to go to Budapest. I didn't much, I wasn't really sure I was supposed to go to the other places that I've been, including Memphis. And so there's a vocational call, but there's also a locational call. And God, God has not only to show us what to do, He's got to show us uh, when to do it, how to do it, where to do it, and who to do it with. Now they thought that they'd solved that business of uh, who they were going to do it with in Antioch when they were commissioned along with John Mark in chapter 13. But he bails in Acts 13, 13. So they couldn't adhere to the plan. The plan is blown up in terms of the composition of the team. Now, um, 
We have to know who we are. Well, they were commissioned. They were, they were called and pronounced missionaries and apostles. And so th they knew what they were supposed to do. And by the way, you, we can always keep backing up and keep backing up. Um, the devil is not creative. You need to understand that. He's clever, and there's a difference. The devil does the same four or five things over and over. You think he's doing four or five thousand things. He's not. He's doing four or five things a thousand different ways. And he disguises what he's doing so cleverly that you think he's doing a bunch of different things. He's not. He's doing a few very simple things. And one thing uh, that he always tries to do is he tries to confuse you in terms of your identity. Who are you? I would even say, without the light of Jesus shining on that question, we can't even determine what we are, much less who we are. I think I actually talked about that the last time we were at the center. John 1 says about Jesus, in him was light, and that light was the light of men. And one thing that means is we can't understand what we are until we understand the Creator's purpose and intention in making us. I think I said this before, I'll say it again, it's a little litany I go through. Uh, the Marxists say that the key to the understanding the human is economic. The fascists say the key to understanding the human is race, racial. The Darwinians say the key to understanding the human is biological. The Freudians say the key to understanding the human is psychosexual. Jesus says the key to understanding the human is me. In him was life. Uh, in him uh, was light and uh, was, was life. And that life is the light of men. That is, it is by his life that we understand what we are. The Bible teaches that to be human is to be a fallen image bearer. How can Christians do such horrible things? Horrible things. It's because we're all fallen. After we're born again, we're still fallen. If we choose to walk away from the light and the energy of the flesh, we can do terrible things. We can do worse things than before we became Christian. Because when we sinned before we were Christians, those were sins in the darkness. Sins of ignorance. We sin now, we're sinning in the light and against the light. It's now treason because we're betraying our best friend. How, to, how do unbelievers do such noble things? And they do. Ever heard of Doctors Without Borders? It's a secular organization. They do amazing things. They'll run straight to Gaza instead of making a half million dollars a year as a physician in the West. They'll run straight to Kabul. They'll run straight to, the, to Ukraine under the bombs. How can unbelievers do such noble things? Because we're all made in God's image. Now, it's marred because of the fall, for sure. But according to James, it's still intact. So what does the Bible teach about what we are? We are fallen image bearers who can only be rescued by a wounded healer. I think you know who the wounded healer is. Well, the devil tries to confuse us about our identity. See, we're never going to know what we're supposed to do until we know who we are. And the Lord of glory, the last words he heard at his baptism in Matthew chapter 3 were, This is my beloved Son. The first, anybody know what the first words he heard were in Matthew 4? When he went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? Anybody remember? If you are the son, turn these stones into bread. If you're the son of God, prove it on my terms. Now, let me, let me just make this clear right now. I'm not trying to get anybody into ministry from business, okay? That's not my motive. Uh, when I was... Uh, when I just became a Christian, I was heavily influenced by Josh McDowell. Josh says that assume you're supposed to go into a Christian service, make, make God show you that you're not. Just aim in that direction. If he wants to turn you around, he can. In my 30s, I was mostly influenced by Martin Lloyd-Jones, 1899-1981, pastor in London. 
Lloyd-Jones would try to talk anybody out of going into the ministry. And his philosophy was, if you can be talked out of it, you better not do it. Now, both positions are extreme, but I promise you I lean in the Lloyd-Jones direction for, for lots and lots of reasons. But I'm, so understand what I'm not trying to do. I'm not trying to get you out of secular work. One reason is because if you're a believer, there is no secular work. It's all sacred. Sweeping the floor is sacred if you do it to the glory of God. <clears throat> but the devil was presenting the Lord with what Timothy Keller calls a self-salvation strategy. If you don't turn these stones into bread, you're going to die of starvation out here. Um, now, I tell you, the devil does the same thing over and over. When Jesus was on the cross, the mockers, who were the devil's agents, said, uh, come down from the cross and then we'll believe that you're the Savior. Save yourself. He saved others, he can't save himself. That's exactly right. That's great theology. Because if he saved himself, he couldn't save others. But you see, they're presenting him with what? With a self-salvation strategy. You better come down from the cross if you can do it, because if you don't, you're going to die. So the devil has his own plan of salvation. It's a self-salvation strategy, and ironically, it leads to death. Now, back to the fact that I'm not trying to talk you out of whatever job you're doing. Uh, if you feel like the Lord may be calling you into ministry, but you're saying, but you know, I've got, I got to support my family. Uh, we got to live. Be careful. Be careful. That, that's not the right argument not to do it if you're feeling called. We got a guy right here who left secular work for the ministry. Uh, but don't, don't use that argument to keep doing what you're doing because that's a self-salvation strategy. Uh, God is calling us to life, not death. And I, I know I, it's, it sounds like I'm trying to do what I said I'm not trying to do, but I am going to throw this in. Uh, I grew up in my student years with a well-to-do father. Not wealth, but well-to-do. My father had 30 cars, and he had an airplane, and he had four houses. When he died, he retired at age 49. When he died at age 67, uh, he was living in my sister's house. He didn't own a house. Now, he built that house and gave it to her, but he didn't own a house. And I was a missionary, and I paid his last car repair bill, and I paid for his last plane ride. Now, I didn't, I didn't pay for the plane ride, which was transatlantic with cash. I paid for it with frequent flyer points. I paid for the car repair. It was a Cadillac, but he, I paid for that with, with cash, you see. So, uh, so God called me away from the family business, which looked really lucrative when I made that decision. But he, he didn't call me to starvation. He didn't call me to death. He called me to life. And I think my father went to heaven. Um, but you've got to be careful with this stuff. But once we know who we are, then we know what we're supposed to do. Now, here's the thing. Um, I'm in vocational ministry, maybe most of you are not, surprise, surprise, we're supposed to do the same thing. The, uh, the only difference is I get paid to do what all, uh, for what all Christians are called to do, and I'm embarrassed by that. And I'm very conscious of that when I expect men and women who are beating their brains out 50 or 60 hours a week trying to support their families and me and I act like I'm expecting them to do all the things that I do. Well, that's not, that's not equitable. Okay. But we've got to figure out who we are. We are called people. We're called to be as close to Jesus as we can be, and when we do that, we're going to be as much like Jesus as we can be. Now, what happens at the end of chapter 15 is they get ready to go back on the second missionary journey. And so Barnabas says, it's after the Council of Jerusalem, which we're not going to talk about. Um, uh, Paul says to Barnabas in 1536, let's go again. Let's get back out there. 
of the second missionary journey now that we clarified the gospel in the Council of Jerusalem. And uh, in verse 37, he says, John Mark's ready to go. He's ready to go again. Paul says in verse 38, he's not going. Barnabas says, what do you mean he's not going? He says, what I mean is he's not going. Well, why isn't he going? Well, because he quit the last time. And I can just hear Barnabas. You know, Paul, Paul, the thing about you is you talk a great game of grace. You preach a great game of grace. You write a great game of grace. But Paul, when it comes to exercising grace, uh, there's a lot left to be desired. And I just hear, I can just hear Paul saying, I'm not saying he's going to hell. I'm not, I'm not saying he can never do ministry again. I'm saying he quit the last time. He's not going this time. And they break up over it. Let me tell you why I love that. I love that because it tells me two things. Number one, it tells me that these narratives are not made up. Because if they were made up, they'd have stuff like that airbrushed out. I can name ten ways that the New Testament would be different if it had been made up. The second reason it encourages me is because if I couldn't find difficulties in the early church and in the apostolic ministries, I would have given up long ago. If I couldn't find that they had problems, that Paul and Barnabas disagreed so sharply that they, they quit the team, they quit partnering, if I couldn't find in Acts 6 that the Palestinian widows couldn't get along with the Hellenistic widows, if I couldn't find in Philippians that Yodi and Sintiki, the two leading women in the church, hated each other's guts, if I couldn't find stuff like that, I would have said, hey, I'm out. Because when I look at the people that God was using, they don't have any problems. I got nothing but problems. He couldn't possibly be using me. But when I see that they had problems and God was using them, I think, well, please, God, maybe there's just this possibility that He might even use me. So I, I praise the Lord from that, for that. So Paul and Barnabas, or Barnabas and John Mark, they go to Cyprus. That's where Barnabas was from. And Paul and Silas have a plan. And the plan is to revisit every church that they had first visited and planted churches on the first missionary journey. Now, one of the, so they set out for Asia Minor. And one of the first places that they visit in Asia Minor, this is Acts 16.1, is Lystra. He goes back to Lystra again. The place where he'd been stoned. You've got to be kidding. And you know what he discovers? He, he discovers that something good happened there that he didn't know about. And let me just say this. Uh, you and I do not have the competence to judge whether a ministry is successful or a failure. We don't have the aptitude to do that. One reason is because we, uh, we don't always use the right gauge. Uh, what if we discover when we uh, thinking about how healthy our church ministries are, what if we discover that God does not count the number of people who are in the worship service, that He only counts the number of the people who are in the prayer meeting? Then how healthy is our church? We don't, uh, when He counted who was giving the most in the treasury, He nominated a woman who gave two pennies as the one who was giving the most. His math isn't like our math. He measured it not by how much she gave, but by how much she had left over. And we don't see things like God sees things, so we're incompetent to make those judgments. And what Paul discovered that what was apparently smoking ruins, that somebody got saved during his ministry. Maybe somebody who was watching him get stoned. Now that man was called by Paul in the book of Philippians is the most valuable Christian in the world. He said, I have no one greater that I could send to you than Timothy. Timothy. 
and a Christian mother and grandmother, how do we know that he got saved under Paul's ministry? Because call, call, Paul calls him my true son in the faith. So whenever you think it didn't work, you don't know whether it worked or not. And you won't know until you get to heaven. Some of the most demoralized people I've ever met are failed church planters. I'm in charge of the residents at Harvest. And one thing I tell them over and over is that ministry is not like being at Harvest, okay? Ministry is like being alone in Irian Jaya. Ministry is like having a little church out on the highway that maybe 40 people are going to come to. That's what ministry. If you don't want to do that, then you're not called to ministry. Don't think that it's all like this, because it's not. And then here's what happens. So uh, we saw in the first missionary journey that the plan had to change because the team changed. John Mark bailed. And in Acts 16, we see something amazing as they set out to go further into Asia Minor. Verse 6 says, when they'd gone through the Phrygia and the Galatian region, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in the Roman province of Asia, which is Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. That's a big chunk of land. After they come to Mycia, they tried to get into Bithynia, but the Spirit wouldn't let them. They're not being prevented by God's enemies. They're being prevented by God. By the way, no enemy of God can close a door. If the door is closed, because God closed it. I once heard the great Helen Roosevelt, greatest speaker I've ever heard, a woman, 20 years in the Congo, medical doctor, medical degree from Cambridge. And she goes to the jungle. Here's what she said. She said, no door is closed on the way in. The door may be closed on the way out, but it's not closed on the way in. If you want to get in, you can get in. You might not be able to get out. But they were prevented. And at that time, verse 8, passing by Messiah, Acts 16, 8, they came down to Troas. Now, uh, nobody can argue that any chapter in the book of Acts is more consequential than chapter 2, which is the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So I'm not saying this is more important than that. But what I'm saying is, uh, what's about to happen is one of the most important things that have ever happened in the history of the world. You say, you mean missions. No, I mean the history of the world. Not just missions, but the world. One significant thing about our theme that we'll see, okay, we're trying to always clarify what it is God wants us to do. And by the way, you need to keep listening. <coughs> God told Abraham in Genesis 22 what he wanted him to do. If he had stopped listening, he would have cut his son's throat. But he kept listening. Actually, the angel intervened and, intervened and I think grabbed his arm because the knife was raised. So they, they come to the port of Ephesus, which is called Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia in <clears throat> pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Two or three things here. Well, here's what we want to think about for a minute. How much time do we have? Okay, wonderful. Um, how do we know what God wants us to do? How, how, does, how does He call us? Um, well, what happened in the redirection here, and, and you see what happens in the first missionary journey, they couldn't adhere to the plan because the team, the composition of the team changed. Here they can't uh, adhere to the plan because um, the route and the venues changed. They couldn't execute the plan. And, um, uh, and, 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 and the more administrative you are, the more that provokes you. The fact that God very often calls an audible at the line of scrimmage. You make the plan in the huddle, you break the huddle, you go line up on the line, you're ready to run the play, and God changes the play. He calls an audible at the last minute. That happens very often in the Christian life. We thought we were going to do this, we ended up doing that. Why? Well, because God rules and overrules. That's why. And um, 
how does God direct us and how does he redirect us? Well, let me just say this. He can do it supernaturally. I've never had a vision. I've never had a voice. I've never seen an angel. And I'm not one of those Christians. I'm not a charismatic Christian, but I'm not anti-charismatic. Uh, I'm not one of those Christians who always discounts that. God can do anything he wants to do. And he can do it supernaturally. Uh, don't long for that, though. Don't lust after those experiences. If God sends an angel to you, the first thing he's going to say is, fear not. And the reason he says, fear not, is because it's about to get real scary. And, and the reason he sends an angel is because this is going to be so scary, this is going to be so painful, the only way you would ever go through with it is because God sent an angel to tell you this is what you've got to do. So don't long for that. That means things are going to get real tough. But I don't discount the possibility, especially as the day, capital D. Luther said there are two days. There's today and the day. As the day draws near, God may unleash all kinds of supernatural stuff. We don't know. We shouldn't be surprised if it happens. Okay, but what other more uh, normal or more calm might the Lord direct us? Well, maybe through His Word. Um, my wife was willing to go overseas for the first time because of something she learned in Psalm 84. I left Memphis to go back overseas. I was overseas eight years, came to Memphis for almost nine years, went back overseas for another 16 years because of something I believe the Lord was teaching me from Psalm chapter 60. The same verses in Psalm 31, the same verses in Psalm 109. And I believed two years before I went overseas for the first time that the Lord was directing me through that verse. But the punch wasn't landed until 2002 when I was living in Memphis. Um, and here's the thing. God may speak to you through a verse that contextually is not what it meant at that time. Um, it may, you may be interpreting a verse that you couldn't defend your interpretation in front of a seminary professor. I couldn't. <coughs> but there's some things that you can't defend, but you also can't deny. They're just there. And you can't get rid of it can't stop thinking about it. Be careful. That's a call. That means God's calling you. Um, Samuel tried to get rid of the voice that was calling to him. He thought it was Eli, and he went to Eli twice. But God kept calling him a third time. And Eli said, that's the Lord. Um, another way that God calls us, or shows us his will, is what I might find a call a, a growing light. When Elizabeth Elliot wrote her book on discovering the will of God, she called it a slow and certain light. Is that biblical? It is. Proverbs 4.18. Proverbs 4.18. I'm going to quote it in the King James. You won't understand it. I, I, uh, I uh, memorized it in the King James because it's so beautiful, but I didn't know what it meant until I read it in the NIV. And I don't even use the NIV. But one day I read it in the NIV and I said, oh, that's what that verse means. Uh, King James, the path of the just is like the light which shineth more and more into the perfect day. What it means is that the path of the just, the right path, shows itself by becoming brighter and brighter like the first gleam of dawn. Let's say you're in a wreck and you're unconscious and you wake up after a long time and it's twilight. You don't know, you don't know which twilight it is. You don't know if it's the twilight of dusk or the twilight of dawn. Well, how do you figure out? Well, you wait. If it gets darker, it's dusk. If it gets brighter, it's dawn. So you think the Lord wants you to go in this certain direction. So you set off, set out in that direction. If things go darker, if God seems more remote to you, if you're having a hard time connecting in prayer or having the Scripture speak to you, turn around. You're going in the wrong direction. Go the other way. If you're directed in a certain direction and things get brighter, keep going. Keep going. Now, another way that Scripture directs us, 
uh, excuse me, another way that God calls us is compulsion. You do it because you have to do it. You do it because you can't do anything else. When I went to Moscow the first time, nothing was going to stop me from going to Moscow. Nothing. I was compelled. I was convinced that that's what God wanted. Is it, is it biblical? It's certainly historical. Some of you will know what Luther said at the Diet of Worms. Some scholars question whether it was really that dramatic and that perfect. But Luther didn't set out to reform the church. And if the Diet of, Diet of Worms spelled like worms, Luther said, Here stehe ich. Here I stand. Ich kann nicht anders. I can do no other. I have to do this. Is it biblical? It's biblical. 1 Corinthians 9. Paul says, hey, don't congratulate me for preaching the gospel. I don't, I don't have any choice. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. I do it because I have to do it. I, ha I do it because I can't not do it. That's a call. That's compulsion. Now, so they had a, a, uh, a, Paul had a supernatural call that they resolved collegially because he consulted his companions and then we see a major shift in the book of Acts because the third person becomes the first person. Paul, uh, Luke tells us that um, in verse 10, we sought to go to Macedonia being convinced that the Lord called us to go minister to them. Up to this point in Acts 16, it had been the third person. They and them. Now it's we and us. So there's a fourth which is joined to the missionary band. The doctor becomes a missionary. And he signs on and gets on the boat. So instead of penetrating further into Asia Minor, they cross the Aegean from east to west and they planted the church on European soil. Now, how did that happen? Well, they found a prayer meeting. They found women who were praying. Now, the vision fetched the apostles, but those, the prayers of those women fetched the vision. You can count on it. God did that because they were praying. The way he started things was not with the vision. He started things with their prayers. Don't ever estimate, underestimate what can happen if a few women are committed to prayer. And ironically, the first named person who was converted on the European continent was a woman, a businesswoman who sold purple from where? From Thyatira. You know where Thyatira is? It's in Asia Minor. So God didn't abandon the province of Asia. There was a native of that place who was the first person to get saved in the place he redirected them to go instead of going to Asia Minor. It's very significant that we know so much about her business as a woman. But she was faithful in prayer and um, she got saved. And um, her whole household got saved, it says in verse 15, and later in chapter 16, the whole household of the Philippian jailer gets saved. In 1984, our second live child was born. We had a stillbirth in 81, a little boy that I'll see soon. And um, our second live birth, uh, whose name is Seth, he, he'll be 40 in about a little over a week and um, he teaches at Westminster Christian Academy and um, I, suddenly the obvious began to dawn on me I thought hey I've got a household I'm the head of a household I've got two children and I remembered Acts 16 this is off topic but I'm going to slip it in here um, and I remembered well you know what we, are, we have two households in Acts 16 and everybody in the household got saved. How does that happen? Is there anything we can learn from Acts 16 to um, catalyze that? 
I found 12 things. Not the topic, though. So I can't tell you what they were. But you can find them. You might find 15 things. I'll tell you one thing. Uh, Lydia entertained missionaries in her home. And so did the Philippian jailer. I could expand on that a lot. But I don't have the time to. Well, guess what? Um, Paul and Silas continued to go to the prayer meeting. Because um, as they uh, continued to go to the place of prayer, it says in verse 16 that as we went to prayer, and then in verse 18 he said, this happened over many days. When they're on the way to the prayer meeting, they were accosted by a spiritual freak. A young girl who was pimped by people making money off the fact that she was full of demons and she could do tricks that people who are not full of demons could not do and they were exploiting that financially. And she would run up to Paul when he was on his way to prayer every day and she would say, these men are uh, servants of the Most High God. They're showing all of us the way of salvation. Now, what's wrong with that? What's untrue about that? Nothing. Why is it a bad thing? It's a bad thing because everybody knows that she's full of demons. Everybody knows that she is uh, compromised spiritually. And so her endorsement does not help. What if I let a, uh, I've led, I don't know, three or four tours. What if I led a tour that included Holland and we visited some of the Reformation sites and we went to Corey Tim Boom's house and we were walking through uh, Amsterdam and we uh, skirt the red light district and a young woman comes out to me and says, Ronnie, didn't know you were in town. Welcome back. And she runs up to me. She's dressed like a prostitute and, and she, and she looks at the group and said, this is one great guy right here. Enjoy him. We've enjoyed him. Does that help me? No. It disgraces me. Well, it was, like, it was something like that. For that girl to endorse Paul did not help the apostolic mission. So after several days, he turns and he delivers her from the demons. And now she's not profitable to her pimps. And they get mad. I have lived in formerly communist countries. I loathe communism. I know what it does. I've seen the wreckage that it leaves, both humanly and economically. And um, I'll tell you what, unregenerate capitalism is just as dangerous if you threaten that income stream. You dig into the profit margin, with the gospel, you're in just as much danger as you would be if you were repudiating Marxism in a communist country. Just as much danger. And those uh, pimps retaliated. When their masters saw that the, their hope of profit was gone, this is verse 19, they caught Paul and Silas. They drew them into the marketplace. And here's what happened. They were beaten. But they weren't just beaten, they were beaten severely. They were stripped and beaten with many stripes, it says in verse 23. So they were beaten severely. Um, they were cast into prison, but not just the prison, the inner prison. And not just the beating and the severe beating and the prison, the inner prison, but the stocks. Their feet were fastened in the stocks. You know what that means? It means they couldn't go to the bathroom. And there wasn't any bathroom, but there could have been a bucket. And if there wasn't a bucket, there was a corner. They couldn't get to the corner. You know why? Because their feet were fastened in the stocks. So what was going to happen? Well, they were going to rot in their own filth. That's what was going to happen. Now, what do you do, Christian? when you do exactly what God wants you to do. And because you did exactly what God wants you to do, you're going to wet and soil your own 
torn skin because you've been freshly beaten, making infection not only unpleasant but inevitable. What do you do in that situation? You did exactly what God told you to do, and this is the result. You know what they did? They worshipped. They worshipped. And they worshipped a long time. They didn't say, let's all pray and then go to bed. They were singing hymns to God past midnight. And something very supernatural has taken hold because the prisoners were not saying, shut that racket up, we're trying to get some sleep. Those prisoners were transfixed. They could not get over it. They'd never seen anything like this because there wasn't anything like this. They were astounded. And then God sends an earthquake. And the walls of the prison are opened, unlocked, and the chains and the stocks fall off. Now, one thing you think about as Christian uh, professionals or businessmen is, what am I supposed to do? That's one reason you meet together, because you're trying to decide what God wants you to do, how you're supposed to conduct your business, how you're supposed to make your secular business sacred. And um, let me just tell you that uh, I've been to Iraq 17 times. I was scared every time. I hope never to go again. Um, I think if I'd been in prison there and if God sent a supernatural way of escape, I'm pretty sure I would have taken it. This is just one of the many differences between me and the Apostle Paul. You probably noticed some other differences. Please keep them to yourself. And um, now there are two supernatural things that happen, really three. Uh, one is the earthquake, which opens the doors and breaks the chains. The other is the fact that the prisoners stayed put. You know, uh, during the days of Noah, there were two miracles. One miracle is the flood, but that was the minor miracle, because we've all heard of floods which destroyed human life. We've heard of that. Which we, what we haven't heard of is that many animals being pacified for that many months. God sedated those animals. That was a miracle. So the other miracle besides the earthquake breaking the chains in Acts 16 is the sedation, the pacification of the prisoners. Because they didn't leave. They didn't run out. Because they realized that earthquake became because of these men. These chains falling off, they didn't just fall off Paul and Silas. They fell off everybody. These chains falling off was because of them, not because of us. We're not going anywhere without them. Now, I mentioned the raised knife in Genesis 22 of Abraham over the throat of his son. Well, this man also raised a knife because he knew about what happened in Acts 12 when Peter escaped his prison sentence and the guards were executed. They were probably executed slowly. And that guard did not want that to happen to him. He, thought, he, he said, I'm not letting him make sport of me and drag this out. I'm going to end it right now. And Paul, like the angel in Acts 22, said, don't do it. We're here. We're all here. What was he saying? He's saying, we're still willing to die for you. You don't have to die. Now, here's the thing. You want to understand missions? I was a missionary for almost 25 years. Very much a junior varsity missionary. Kind of a less pretend missionary. Because I've never taught or preached in any language but English. I, I did what I could. But you're never going to understand missions until you understand why Paul and Silas didn't run out of that prison. And the reason was because they were already free. It was the jailer who was imprisoned. They knew who they were. And they knew what they were supposed to do. And redemption means, if redemption is be, to be affected, there comes a time in the life and career of the Redeemer where he has a choice 
between delivering himself or delivering the person who needs to be redeemed. And Paul and Silas, knowing who they are, they knew what they were supposed to do. And what they were saying was, you don't have to die because we're willing to die. We're all here. They stayed put. You see, they were free to do anything, to do the right thing, to do the powerful thing, to do the righteous thing, to do the redemptive thing. He was the one who was enslaved. And because they stayed, that man asked the question that every uh, missionary, every pastor, every evangelist wants to hear. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be like you are? And who are you like, by the way? Who does this? Only Jesus. Only Jesus. So, uh, as you discover who you are, remember what you're supposed to do. And no matter where you work, or no matter what you do, there will be occasion for you to defend others and not to defend yourself. There will be occasion for redemptive ministry. And there will be occasion for real discipleship. Finding one person and helping him to get to where God wants him to be. That's what ministry is. Ministry is not an office. It's not a position. It's a function. It's helping people get from where they are to where Jesus wants them to be. May you be fruitful in ministry. It's been a joy to be with you. God bless you.